In unit one, we looked at simplifying radicals like problem number one here, where the, what was inside the square root was just a number. If you go back and re, uh, recall the process we talked about, one of the things that we said that we were looking at when we were looking to simplify, a, uh, for example, here a square root, is we were looking for pairs of numbers or square numbers that were factors of this that we could pull out nicely. One of the procedures that we did when we were looking at something like this was to look at the prime factors of a number. So for example, we could break down 24 into 6 times 4, we could break 6 down into 2 times 3, and 4 down into 2 times 2. And after we've done that, what we're looking for is we're looking for pairs of numbers. And any time that we had found a pair, we could put that we could break our square root down. Anything that had a perfect square in it, like here 2 times 2 was 4 was a perfect square, could go in the first square root, and any leftovers could go in the second square root. Like here we had a 2 and a 3 left over, 2 times 3 is 6. So by design, when we put anything that had a pair of factors, when we go to take the square root, it's actually going to work nicely. So here the square root of 4, for example, is 2. And anything that only had single factors, like 2 times 3, well, we can't simplify that anymore. So in this case, when we wanted to find the square root of 24, we could simplify that to be 2 times the square root of 6. Since then, we've been spending a lot of time working with variables and, uh, to a lesser extent, exponents. And what I'd like to do today is to go back and revisit that idea of simplifying radicals when we have variables involved. So let's take a peek here at the, the next example. One of the things, if you think of what, in this case, we want to find the square root of x to the sixth. If you go back and think of what x to the sixth means, we have x times x times x times x times x times x, so we have that show up six times. In the context of what we did over here with problem one, if we're trying to take the square root of something, we're looking for things that have pairs of factors. Here we have a pair of x's. Here we have another pair of x's. Here we have another pair of x's. So in this case, when we look at x to the sixth, because everything is a pair, this is a perfect square, and we can actually take the square root of it. If you think what times itself could give me x to the third, well, it's going to be, or sorry, what times itself could give me x to the sixth, it's going to be x to the third. And so if you think of why is that true, well, what I have is I have three pairs of x's. So uh, when we take the square root of that process, it's x to the third. And you can go back and kind of revisit that if you're, if, if you're a little bit confused here. Remember, x to the third times x to the third means three x's from this one and three x's from this one, and that gives us x to the sixth altogether. There's definitely some patterns here. You can uh, divide by two when you're looking at variables, which is different than taking the square root, or when you're looking at variable powers, which is different than taking the square root when you're looking at variable numbers. But coming back to this idea of looking at pairs, finding perfect squares, and then rethinking what could you multiply by itself there to make that work. Uh, those are really good processes to double check yourself with these. Now, with that in mind, let's look at kind of some bigger values and see what could happen. In problem number three here, we want to look at the square root of 200, x to the fifth, y to the eighth, and z to the ninth. We're going to deal with each of these value sets individually when we go through. If we start with 200, we can look at all of the prime factors of 200. 200 is, uh, well, it's even. That's 2 times 100, 2 times um, 50. 50 is 5 times 10, and 10 is 2 times 5. So just break it down as far as you can. Again, we're looking for pairs of values. So in this case, we have a, a pair of 2s, and we have a pair of 5s, and then we have one leftover 2 out of that bunch. So if I'm going to go through and break my um, expression down into our perfect squares and our leftovers here, I have 2 times 2 times 5 times 5, which is 100, which is a perfect square. And then I had a leftover of 2, which I could put over in the second value here. Now I need to go through and figure out the same sort of thing for each of my variables. If I look at x to the fifth, that's going to be 5x's. And I'm looking for pairs of things that work. So here I have a pair of x's. I have another pair of x's with one leftover. So when I want to break it down here into something that's going to work perfectly, and then the leftovers, I'm going to put x to the fourth in the first group and x in the second group. Again, all I'm doing is just rewriting this square root as multiplying two things together, all the perfect squares being in one and all the leftovers being in the other. When I get to the y's, it was y to the eighth. So here I have eight y's all together, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if I look for pairs, a pair of y's, a pair of y's, a pair of y's, a pair of y's, y to the eighth is a perfect square, and we can put that 
all in the first one with no y's in the leftovers. For z to the ninth, same thing. We've got z to the ninth power. So there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're looking for pairs. There's one pair, two pairs, three pairs, four pairs with one leftover z. So I can write this as z to the eighth in the first one with a leftover z in the second. So from here to finally get my final answer here, I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of this. It should be a perfect square, so I'm looking for what times what will get me 100. Uh, x to the 4th, y to the 8th, z to the 8th. So 10 times 10 gets me 100. x squared times x squared gives me x to the 4th. y to the 4th times y to the 4th gets me up to y to the 8th. And z to the 4th times z to the 4th gets me up to z to the 8th. So there's my perfect square breakdown. And then in the leftovers, I had a 2 and an x and a z that didn't have any pairs of values. So that ends up being remaining inside my square root symbol. And this would be my final solution to that problem. OK, uh, so that's the basic idea and how we kind of add in that mix of having variables in there. Uh, for the last problem here, I just wanted to kind of show you the process for a cubed root. It's going to be very, very similar, um, except instead of looking for perfect squares or doubles like we did here with a square root, what we're looking at here is perfect cubes or triples. And then all the leftovers will go in the second. And again, we're breaking down cube roots for each of these. So all my perfect cubes go in the first one, and we'll be able to take the cubed root to get an answer. All the leftover cubes will go in the second one, and will stay in the cubed root as part of my final, most simplified solution. We're going to do exactly the same thing over here. If we look at 16, 16 is 4 times 4. We can break each of those down into 2s. This time, since I want a cube root, I'm looking for triples. There's a triple set of 2s, which is going to give me an 8 in the first group and a 2 in the second group. For x to the fourth here, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm looking for cubes, triples of x's. There's one set of x cubes that's going to work great, and one leftover x that's going to go in the leftover pile over here. For y to the fifth, I have five y's. Looking for cubes. So we have a y to the third that's in a perfect cube, and we have two y's left over, so we're going to end up with y squared in our leftover bin. And then for z to the ninth, let's see, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And again, we're looking for perfect cubes. There's one set. There's another set. There's a third set. Look at that. They are all perfect cubes. So z to the ninth in the first group with no leftovers for z's represented in the second group. So now all we need to do is these, this first uh, cube root is made up of all perfect cubes. So we should be able to answer and bring these out of the cubed root um, function. The cubed root of 8 is 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 gives me 8. Cubed root of x cubed is just plain old x. The cubed root of y cubed is just plain old y. And the cubed root of z to the ninth is going to be z to the third, because z to the third times z to the third times z to the third ends up getting me the nine sets of z's that we have represented here. So. Um, that's going to be what happens when I take the, the cubed root of that perfect cube. And then my answer still needs to include all those leftovers, so the cubed root of 2xy squared is going to be my remaining answer. So this is going to actually be my um, cubed root expression in its simplest form, even though it might look a little bit more complicated to you. But we've pulled out any perfect cubed factors and are looking with what's left behind as only what those leftover values are.